I'm live here on Facebook. Yes. All right, y'all. PDT here, Prophet David Taylor, coming on a few minutes early because as you hear me say all the time, if I come on a few minutes late, people think I'm not going to show up. So I learned how to come on early. So I let my group know that I was on. And uh, so I'm going to start in a couple more minutes, start on time at 2.30. Hope everybody's been having a good week. Um, I don't know what the weather's been like uh, where you live, but <sighs> where I live, it's been raining and then really, really hot and then rainy and overcast, and then really, really hot. <laughs> and yesterday was super hot. Yesterday was, this is still May. Yesterday was like a July day. It felt like it was like an oven outside. And today it's just a little bit more rainy and overcast, but you know, kind of is what it is. But <clears throat> seems like the weather's a roller coaster sometimes, just like everything else. <laughs> Just like everything else, if we haven't learned anything from 2020, we learned to expect the unexpected. We learned to prepare for, for stuff that you may not have seen coming. Okay, because that's very, very common. All right. Trying to make sure uh, everybody in my group saw the message. Okay. All right. All right, good. So I uh, have, you know, people that watch me live, I have people that watch on the replay. I also have a newsletter list uh, so I can alert people every week to uh, what has dropped and what's going on so they don't miss any content. So if you want to get on my newsletter list, that's on my Facebook page, Prophet David Taylor, and it's a little button underneath the top header that says sign up. That'll get you on the newsletter list. No spam, because I hate spam, so I don't send people spam. So just a, an alert to let you know what has dropped this week. Okay, I send that out every week on early Friday morning, so you can see all the content I've made available for the week. My music, ministry, videos, whatever. Okay. All right, it's 2.30, so we are going to start right now. So let's jump on in with a word of prayer. Then we'll get into today's live prophetic word. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for yet another day. Thank you for more breath. Thank you, Lord, for more strength. Thank you, Lord, for more uh, thoughts. Thank you, Lord, for your hand of grace and mercy always staying on us and uh, helping us. Oh, God, and thank you for your patience and thank you for your understanding and thank you for your kindness and thank you for all that you've already done and thank you for all that you continue to do so lord i must decrease so you can increase oh god so i surrender myself to you right now god please forgive me for any sin wash me clean by the blood of jesus and fill me with the holy ghost oh god and breathe through me let the word spoken be what you want spoken oh god so that this message might be an encouragement and an edification and a comfort to those who hear it and I declare and decree that signs and wonders and miracles do follow this word, all that. Hear it, believe it, obey it, oh God. And we're looking for you to do great things because your word always has power. Your written word has power. Your living word, you yourself have power. The prophetic word has power. So help us to walk in the power of this word to deliver us and set us free. And I thank you for it and I believe you for it in Jesus' name, amen. All right. First thing I want to do before I jump into today's word is I want to talk a little bit more. I have to give some uh, clarity, some follow up to some things I said last time, because I should have been a little bit more uh, clear, a little bit more clear in what I was saying. Uh, first thing I want to talk about is I said that Malachi was not chronologically the last book in the Old Testament, that is in one of the Hebrew translations, one of the Hebrew Bibles and one of the Hebrew chronological orderings does not have Malachi last. That's what I was looking at because it's based on the Hebrew, but many, many, many other 
scholars and and historians uh, talk about. Remember, I told you that Malachi has some contemporaries. Well, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and Malachi all happen in the same time period. Now, it depends on who you read, uh, but they were all contemporaries. Like most scholars agree that when Nehemiah asked the king, when he's praying for the exiles and Nehemiah asked the king to go back to Jerusalem so he could rebuild the wall, that the queen on the throne at that time was Esther. So let me give you some sample chronologies, okay? So uh, one scholar says that Ezra, the pro proclamation of Cyrus, Ezra 1 through 5, happens around 537 BC, okay? And then Esther comes to power as the queen, Esther 1 through 10, uh, that process starts around 4. 83 BC. And then uh, Ezra goes to Jerusalem first. That happens at 458 BC. BC stands for before Christ. And then Nehemiah gets involved around 445. And then Malachi 1 through 4 happens around 430 BC. That's actually what most of them say, but that one Hebrew translation I was looking at did not have Malachi there. But in terms of the way uh, most scholars reckon the Bible time frame we're dealing with, uh, you know, a 70 year, uh, 80 year period. Cause like I said, the, uh, the, uh, beginning, the proclamation of Cyrus, which is Ezra's time, the first five chapters of Ezra, they say happen around 537 and Malachi doesn't happen until about 430 BC. So that's, you know, 93 years. So it's a little bit of a time span in there, but, uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and Malachi all happen within that time, all happen within that time. So um, again, another scholar says, uh, biblehub.com says that Queen Vashti is deposed around 483 and Esther becomes queen around 478 BC. So it didn't happen right away. There's a few years in there, but around 478 BC is uh, when Esther becomes queen. And uh, Ezra goes to Jerusalem about 458 BC. Nehemiah starts his prayer for the exiles around 445 BC. And then uh, Nehemiah completes the wall, wall around uh, 444 BC. And then uh, years later in 430 is when you get Malachi one through four. So again, uh, they say that uh, Malachi did happen last, most of them, but there's one Hebrew version that says it didn't, it wasn't, and they had the time frame different. That's the one I was looking at, so that's what I said about. But most of the scholars, most of the people that do the chronological ordering of the Bible and do the timeline say that Malachi happened last around 430 BC, but, excuse me, I'm getting some water. But Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and Malachi were all happening in the same frame, but depending on, again, when you start it, it's um, um, close to an 80, maybe uh, not quite a hundred year period, but maybe uh, an 80 year period or so between all the stuff's happening, because it doesn't all happen at the same time. And that's one of the reasons you kind of have to investigate, inv investigate chronology on your own, because in most of the translations of the Bible, it doesn't have a chronological listing or it marks what you're reading by saying things like in the year that so-and-so died or in the time of harvest or in this season or in that season. So you got to kind of get behind that and see kind of what's going on. Okay. So I just wanted to put that out there that most scholars do count Malachi as being chronologically last and as happening last and as written last. And I said it wasn't chronologically so because I was looking at one of the Hebrew versions that does not order it that way. But according to the timeline that most scholars agree upon, Malachi did indeed happen around 430 BC. And then all the other stuff I told you about Ezra, Nehemiah, and Queen Esther were happening before that. So I just want to put that out there because I didn't want incorrect information out there. I should have been more broad uh, in what I was saying because I just kind of threw it out. And I should have been more broad in what I'm saying now that according to what I was looking at, but this is what the other sources say. Okay, so there's that. Number two, same thing about 
uh, Mary and Elizabeth, uh, because a lot of people say that Jesus and John the Baptist were first cousins. Well, for that to be true, then Mary and Elizabeth have to be sisters. But what the scripture says is one translation says that cousin, the Greek word there is better translated relative or kindred. So, you know, people have been saying, and some scholars say for a long time that Jesus and John the Baptist were first cousins, but they were related, but perhaps they were second cousins because the original word doesn't get as specific to say, it just says relative in most translations, but um, in, uh, I believe it's King James, it says that Mary and Elizabeth were cousins, and then a lot of other translations say they were relatives or close kin. And then uh, some people say they were sisters, which is how the only way you can get Jesus and John the Baptist being first cousins is if Mary and Elizabeth were sisters. But again, the most common translation is relative or kindred, and then it doesn't say what level of cousin when it does use the English word cousin, it doesn't say first, second, third, or fourth. It just says relative or kindred. But some people have extrapolated that all the way out to being sisters and then some keep it with cousins. So the best we can say for sure is that Jesus and John the Baptist were related on some level, more related on some level. But uh, it says that, that Mary and Elizabeth were kindred or related or kin. And then a lot of people take it from there in English and say cousin, and some just says some some just say relative. As I looked at most of the available translations, they actually say relative, because that's probably closer to what the original word means. It's related kin in some kind of way. So just want to put it out out uh, there too, because I should have said that as well too. Because once again, I just threw it out. I should have done what I'm doing now. I should have done just a little bit broader exegesis too. Let you know where I was getting that information from, because I didn't. The last thing in the world I want to do is be putting out wrong information. So I just wanted to make those corrections slash additions, and you know, give a broader context for what I was saying, why I was saying what I was saying, and what the you know most scholars actually say, and what the original words actually say, because Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic are broader than English, and so when you read the Bible in English, you're reading a translation of what was originally said. And so sometimes people just go different ways. It depends on who you're reading because uh, there are many, many broad meanings. So, but you kind of have to take the time to, to uh, you know, put all that out there or understand all that. And so that's why I just wanted to be sure I put that out there uh, to give a broader view. So it doesn't sound like I'm just throwing stuff out without context or you didn't understand where I was getting stuff from. Okay. All right. So that's that. That's for last nine. Last time. Today's live prophetic word is get your head straight. What I said today's live prophetic word is get your head straight. So we're going to look at, <clears throat> we're going to look at, Romans 12 and 2. Romans 12 and 2. Very familiar scripture. Okay. Scripture that is talked about often. But today, hopefully, we're going to get some more insight and some different insights, some stuff we haven't heard before from the Holy Ghost, To That's why a live prophetic word on a regular basis is so important. That's why you hear me keep saying it all the time. What is God saying now? Because God is a person. He's not a set of rules. That's how people get caught up in traditions of men. And that's how people experience certain things. And then they build a whole denomination. They build a shrine around an experience instead of worshiping God by understanding that he's a person. Because it's so easy to worship something that God did instead of worshiping him, which is what a lot of people do. That's why a lot of people have what I call brand loyalty Christianity. And what that means is that they are brand loyal to their brand of Christianity because of what they experienced. That's not wrong or bad because no one can tell you what you did or did not experience. But what you know is not all there is to know because God is a person 
and he's unlimited and his word will be unfolding for all of eternity. That's not something any human can understand or comprehend or capture. Okay. All right. So Romans 12 and two in today's live prophetic word is get your head straight. Again, very familiar scripture. I'm going to start with the New Living Translation. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Wow. English Standard Version, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and, and acceptable and perfect. Wow. Berean Study Bible, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Wow. <laughs> Each one of those translations just blows me away because they're so action-packed. So let's start from the top. When it says, do not be conformed, okay, to that phrase coming out of the Greek means to fashion alike or to conform to the same pattern. So when it says do not be conformed, it means do not fashion something alike or conform it, fashion and create it along the same pattern. And we're gonna talk about that pattern in a minute. But the first point I wanna make here is that this is one of our basic struggles as human beings. As human beings, we have this great tendency to look at other people and or look at other uh, situations and then judge ourselves by that other person, by those other people and by those other situations. I stop by to tell you that nobody does that except people. Nothing in nature does that. Nothing in nature does that. Oranges, you ain't never seen an orange tree holding its head down Talking about, uh, I guess I don't want to grow anymore. I guess I'm uh, I'm not the most popular fruit because everybody don't like oranges. Some people like apples. You ain't never, never heard no orange tree saying nothing like that. You never heard no octopus saying, well, I'm down here in the water and I got these eight tentacles and I got these little beady eyes and I can squirt out this ink and I'm never going to be on the presidential seal. I'm never going to be majestic like the eagle, so I guess I should just stop being an octopus because they don't like me. You never heard no octopus. <laughs> you never heard no octopus say anything like that. Ever, 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 do you see anything in nature say that it's not going to be what it is because of something that it's not? Never do you see anything else in nature decide that somehow it doesn't have value uh, compared to something else or because it's not as popular as something else or whatever you want to say. Nothing in nature does that. Everything in nature, as Ray Charles says, it kind of do what it do. Everything in nature, we had that song way, way back, throwback song called Trees. Trees don't want to be mountains. They just praise the Lord. Mountains don't want to be valleys. They just praise the Lord. The sun, the moon, the stars are happy in their heavenly place. That's a throwback song, gospel song. But nothing, nothing God created does that except for some reason humans. And it has to be, has to come from sin. It has to be a part of the fall. But still, even though all of nature was still affected by sin, this all of nature still don't do that. Still, still does not do that. You don't, you don't see the gorillas getting mad at God saying, how come we're not the mountain lion? You don't see the butterfly getting mad at God talking about how come we're not the bullfrog and vice versa. You don't see anything doing that. And so 
So the first point under get your head straight is when it talks about do not be conformed, do not fashion like. First thing you need to realize is our weakness as humans is that we have that great weakness as human beings as being the only thing that God made that seems to want to compare, to want to compare itself to something else or something that is not, or, or somehow determining, here's the big one, somehow determining your value because of another human being, okay? Let me tell you what it is that people care about, and then I will prove to you that it's what we care about. Let me tell you what people care about. People care about <clears throat> the size of the house that we live in. People care about who they're sleeping with, their sexual lives. People care about who they're attached to. And people think that we are better or worse based on those things. How do I know that's true? Because when you try to minister to someone about Jesus and they say they don't need the Lord, why do they say that they don't need the Lord? They say, look at my kids. Look at my house. Look at my spouse. I'm just fine. Let me say that one more time. <laughs> Whenever you try to minister to someone that tells you that they don't need the Lord, there's a great tendency for them to say, look at my kids. I got beautiful children. Kids all right. They say, look at my house, because what we think is the, the bigger the house I live in, the more all right I am. And what we tend to think is third thing is look at my spouse, because what we believe is that if you're sleeping with somebody attractive, if you're married to somebody attractive, that somehow that makes you better, you're doing better, whatever. And, and everybody you know, if they could hook up with their favorite celebrity, they'd be walking around bragging. They'd be walking around doing a whole bunch of stuff. If you got a chance to lay with your celebrity crush. Now, of course, as Christians, we shouldn't be doing that. But I'm keeping it real talking about how we behave as people. If you got a chance to lay with somebody that you thought was famous or important, or just extraordinarily attractive, you think that makes you a better person because of who you're sleeping with. And you most certainly would throw that in other people's faces and you would strut around to about, hey, look at me. You know, I'm going out with whoever. I'm going out with a supermodel. Or I'm dating a celebrity, whatever. That is exactly how we think. Don't even try to front like we don't think like that. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We defend ourselves based on look at my kids. Because if my kids are attractive or even if they're just all right or even if I just have them, we think that makes us better than people that don't have children. Is that look at my kids, look at my house, because I know for sure people judge their worth and their value by what their houses are appraised at. So they said, look at my house. And you definitely, if you live in a big house, definitely think you, you know, or some people do, think they're better than people that don't. There's a tendency to think that because I know everybody that has a big house doesn't have the big head. But a lot of people do. But there is definitely a tendency on that third one is that if your husband is tall and hot, if your wife is beautiful and all that, definitely think you're a cut above. Definitely think you're doing better in life because of who you're sleeping with. Because if we have a chance to sleep with somebody attractive, we think that makes us better than our fellow men. You can't tell me we don't think that way. Yes, we do. You can't tell me we don't think that way. Yes, we do. We say, look at my children, look at my house, look at my spouse, I'm just fine. Yes, we do. Yes, we do, okay? And so there's that great tendency on the part of people to define ourselves that way and to defend ourselves that way. And I stopped by to tell you that that, that doesn't determine our worth or our value before God, the judge, <laughs> the one who judges our lives. Just because you live in a big house, David was the king and what he did was wrong in the eyes of God. So God judged him. I want you to notice that the castle didn't have nothing to do with what David did with Bathsheba. Did you notice that when David slept with another man's wife and then got her pregnant, 
and then try to get that man to sleep with Bathsheba, try to get Uriah to sleep with Bathsheba, to pass the baby off as his. Uriah wouldn't do it, so then King David had him and all his regimen killed because David didn't want to have him killed directly because then it would have been obvious it was an assassination. So David had his regimen go up against in a warfare engagement and then have either the shield carriers, carriers or whoever back away from them so the arrows being shot from the people on the enemy wall could hit them because David didn't just take Uriah out. He took all of them men out in an effort to get to Uriah, okay? I want you to notice that when God judged him for that, God did not mention the palace. <laughs> God did not mention the fact that King David lived in a palace. That didn't have nothing to do with what he did. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. That, that that is something that as people, we believe deeply. We believe it deeply. But when God judged King David for what he did, he didn't mention his living space, okay? When Samson was fooling around with Delilah, Samson had a covenant with God before he was born and Samson was a Nazarite. Remember I talked about that a little bit last time too. Uh, Nazarites weren't supposed to shave their heads. Nazarites weren't supposed to drink wine or strong drink. That means wine or whiskey, wine or liquor, because there's more ways to get lit than wine. There's whiskey and hard alcohol, a whole bunch of stuff, hard drinks. They weren't supposed to drink anything like that, nor have their head shaved. And there's a few more stipulations on Nazarites too, depending on which group you're talking about. But the point I'm trying to make is that it was a mark of consecration to God to have the hair not cut and for there to be no uh, wine or strong drink. And another one was they weren't supposed to touch dead things. Anything that was dead or expired, Nazarites weren't supposed to deal with that at all. So that was a sign of consecration. And so when Delilah pressed Samson, she pressed him and pressed him and pressed him and pressed him until he finally told her the strength of the secret of his great strength. And he, he told her about his covenant with God and that as long as I don't shave my head, my covenant with God is intact. And so then Delilah shaved his hair and then said, the Philistines be upon you. And Samson got up and thought he was just going to shake himself and his strength is going to come back. And then his Holy Ghost strength did not come upon him because he broke his covenant. He got out of contract with God. And so he ended up being captured by his enemies and then they blinded him and put his eyes out. So the point I'm making and bringing that up is that when the judgment of God happened, when the anointing and presence of God lifted off of Samson, it had everything to do with Samson breaking his covenant and nothing to do with how attractive Delilah was or was not. <laughs> did you notice that when Samson went through all that, that the Lord didn't mention how attractive Delilah was or was not? Because that didn't have nothing to do with it. <laughs> That's what we think, that if we're having sex with somebody really, really pretty, or if we're having sex with somebody really, really famous, that means that the wages of sin ain't going to be death, or that means that we're better than other people. And that means a whole bunch of stuff that only we as humans think. But God ain't never said that. Only we as humans think. But God never said that. God never mentioned when the Lord withdrew from Samson. God never mentioned how attractive Delilah was or was not. Because that didn't have nothing to do with it. So the reason I'm belaboring this point is to help you understand that when the Bible talks about in Romans 12 and 2, let me put that on the screen because that's what I'm talking out of. When the Bible talks about don't be conformed, conformed means to fashion alike. So the Bible, so I'm pointing out some of the ways that we think as humans to let you see that what God is saying don't have nothing to do with what we think is important. And let me move on to the next phrase. Do not be conformed to this world, to this world, okay? Uh, that word there means properly in age, okay? Uh, so it's translated in a lot of translations, the world. Uh, New Living Translation says the customs of this world, the customs of this age. What that is talking about is when Paul said it, he could be talking about 
the contemporary wisdom of his time. He could be talking about the customs and the standards and the values and the mores of his day, the day in which he wrote Romans. It's normally most often translated the customs of this world, meaning the worldly way of thinking, the way that people that don't know God do things. Because when the Bible talks about the kingdom of the world, it's not talking about the earth. It's not talking about the grass and the trees and the rocks and the dirt and the animals. It's not talking about the earth. It's talking about Satan's kingdom, also known in the Bible as Babylon, meaning the way the devil does things and the things that the devil sets up. So it's talking about not to be conforming your thinking, fashioning your thinking like people that don't know God, like people that uh, follow the dictates of the world. It also can mean, like I said, like whatever the standards, whatever the norm is for your day and age, do not be conformed to this age. So in other words, if you notice, once again, once again, I have to point out our behavior as people, I want you to notice something. If you're over the age of 20, if you are over the age of 20, you have already lived long enough to see the standards and values of people change dozens of times, change constantly. Think about it. One of the best indicators is slang. People use slang all the time. And what people hate is when you use slang, that's out of date. Oh, that's just the worst thing ever. And oh, you're just so uncool and you're just so old and you're just, you know, whatever. So if you use the wrong slang, people just lose their minds. You know, we've been saying something for a long time that something was fire or that's dope or that's heat. Or sometimes we say that's cold or whatever, whatever kind of slang we're using at the time. But if you use the wrong slang, Lord, how many people just lose their minds because that's what people think is important. Because it's so important to be cool and use the right slang and you're just so old and blah, 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 blah. Because that's really important to people. Okay. You know, that's not important to God, right? <laughs> you know, whatever generation of slang you use, you know, that's not really a thing. You know that, right? Because truth don't change. Okay. Uh, uh, values, mores, customs, worldly wisdom, wisdom of the age, that changes. Truth don't change. Truth is immutable. Truth don't have nothing to do with how old you are. Truth don't have nothing to do with your opinion of it. Okay. That's why God is a rock because he doesn't change. It doesn't matter how people are dressing. It doesn't matter what kind of slang people are using. It doesn't matter what people consider to be uh, normal relationships or whatever type of sexual relationships we're defining or however we're defining family. None of that matters to what God says because God does not change. So Paul is saying, don't shape your thinking based on the standards of your time. That can also mean don't shape your thinking based on the age of man or like how we do things or the worldly age or, or the time in which we live or what's going on around you. Don't That's what it means. Don't be conformed to this world because in Greek, it means closer to age or time. So Paul is saying, don't let your thinking be shaped by that. Why? I just told you why. Because it changes every five minutes. You won't ever be able to build anything if you're always chasing trends. What is one of the biggest things people got going on in their lives right now? Social media. And I told you, remember, I told you just a few minutes ago, people think they're better than other people because they have a lot of followers. Just because you have a lot of people that follow you on social media, that's not a good or a bad thing, but that does not make you a, a better or worse person. It just means you have a lot of people that engage with you or follow you on social media. If, you know, if you do something that's not right in the eyes of God, <laughs> your judgment is going to be based on what you did, not how many people follow you. The impact is going to impact all the people that follow you, but that doesn't make what you did right or wrong just because you got a lot of followers. And many times, once again, we defend ourselves by saying, look at my social media. Look at how many people listen to me or follow me or do whatever. And, and if you have a whole lot of followers, if you embezzle some money, 
that doesn't change the fact that you embezzle some money just because you have a lot of followers. You understand what I'm saying? Embezzling is wrong. It's not less wrong because you're popular. <laughs> That's the way we think as people. So Paul is saying, don't let your thinking be fashioned according to uh, the standards of man, to standards of the time you live in, the age of man, the kingdom of the devil. What the devil cares about is lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Paul is saying, don't let your thinking be fashioned by that. Today's live prophetic word is you got to get your head straight. So since the Bible told us about the don't, then what is the do? If the scripture tells me don't do this, then naturally I want to know, well, then what should I do? So the Bible says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That phrase, be transformed, means to transform, transfigure, okay? Uh, it's where we get the word metamorpho from, metamorphosis, to transform, coming out of the Greek. From two different words, uh, meta and morpho, but we get metamorphosis from those words. So it means to transform, to, to change the form of a thing from one shape, one form, or configuration to another, to transform from something to something else. So the Bible says that we're supposed to take our thinking and transform it uh, from the worldly thinking, from the thinking of the age, from the thinking of everything going on around us, but transform it by the renewing, a renewal or change of heart and life. It also can mean renovation of your mind, which means the intellect by implication, thinking. Now, I want to look at that word renewing because this is something that we get hung up on, this hangs up believers and unbelievers, both saints and sinners get hung up on this, which is why you have to read what the Bible actually says. The Bible says there is a renewal or of change of heart and life. So in other words, when you get saved, you're not supposed to keep living <laughs> like you were living when you weren't saved. Let me say that one more time. <laughs> because one of the biggest problems that both believers and unbelievers have with American Christianity is that a lot of it is, is profession. You profess to be a Christian, but so much of it is not lived out. So in other words, we say all this christian sound and stuff. We say all this stuff but then we're not actually living what we're saying. And that causes problems. That's where, again, unbelievers get so much of their ire worked up and so much of their ammunition against us and so much of their accusations against us as believers when we're saying one thing, but we're doing something else. See, that's not what the Bible is saying. <laughs> See, that's not actual Christianity where I'm saying all this, oh, praise the Lord, hallelujah, I'm doing all this stuff but then I'm living like I was back before I was saved or I'm doing something like that. That's not what the Bible's talking about. The Bible says you're, you're transformed by a change of heart and life, a renovation. So in other words, because I can honestly say that I am not the same person now as I was when I first got saved, that I'm not the same now as I was even two years ago, even two years ago. Back in 2019, I'm not the same person now as I was in because I have grown in my walk with Christ and my life has changed. That's what I'm trying to say. That's what the Bible says, that there's got to be a change of heart and life. In other words, what's going on in here, your values, how you're thinking, what you really believe. It's got to be changed and it's got to be impacted by the renewing of your mind. And by the, when it's talking about the renewing of your mind, it means making your mind and your thoughts new according to the word of God. Okay? And so that's why both unbelievers and believers have a problem when we say that we're Christians, but we live like we're not. <laughs> or we say that we're Christians, but we blatantly and openly agree with things that are against the Bible. That's what causes all the dissonance because 
You're just professing to be a Christian, but you're living something that's in conflict with the scriptures. Both sinners and saints have a problem with that. But that's not that that kind of double life is not actually what the Bible teaches. Okay, I had a friend of mine call that one time. She called that greasy grace. <laughs> I love that phrase. She said, You talk about the grace of God, but that's some greasy grace. Greasy grace is what a lot of people teach. That means you don't have to change. You don't have to repent. That's not what the Bible says. To repent means literally to change your mind specifically towards God. That's what it means coming out of the original language. It means to change the way you thought specifically towards God. So in other words, in plain English, I stopped thinking the way I was thinking and I started thinking the way God wanted me to think. I stopped thinking and once I stopped thinking the way I was thinking, I'm gonna stop doing what I was doing and I'm gonna start doing what God wants me to do. That's what it means to repent, specifically to change your mind towards God. So the Bible keeps saying that there's supposed to be a change. There's supposed to be a change of heart, a change of mind, and a change of life. And what is the determinant of that change? The change is the word of God. That what God says gets in our hearts and cleans, cleanses, cleans out the other stuff that was in our hearts. What God says gets in our minds and cleans out the thoughts that were not from God. That's what that means, that, that we don't keep living like we were living before we knew the Lord. That's where people get confused and angry and say that Christians are hypocrites and phonies and all this different kind of stuff because there's no change. But the Bible says there's supposed to be a change. And then the Bible says in the Brian Study Bible version, I'm still in Romans 12 and 2, then you will be able to test and approve what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. English Standard Version, that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God what is good and acceptable and perfect, New Living Translation, <clears throat> then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Now, wait just a minute. <laughs> this is why you have to actually read the scriptures and this is why you have to get behind the English. The Bible just told you that knowing God's will for you is something you have to test, discern, and learn. That means you don't automatically know. I've heard Bishop Jakes preach about that a lot. Bishop Jakes talked about how it takes time sometimes to figure out who it is that you are. It takes time sometimes to figure out what it is you're supposed to do. It doesn't happen all at once. Okay, it took Moses 80 years for him to accept his destiny, that he was the deliverer. He's 80 years old when he finally, and that's because God got in his face with a burning bush and took away all his excuses. Because Moses still didn't want to do it, <laughs> okay? But the point I'm trying to make there is that the Bible just told you, you have to test God's will. You have to learn to know God's will. You have to discern what, what God's will is. All that means, all the Bible just told you that is not automatic and it's not automatic and it doesn't happen just because you get saved. You have to do something. And the something that you have to do is you have to get rid of the old thinking that's conformed to the age of man, the way we think now, the standards, values, mores of people of the time that you live in and of the kingdom of the world, which the devil runs, not the earth, but the kingdom of the world. You have to not let yourself be, be shaped according to that kind of thought, but you have to let yourself be transformed, metamorphosized, that has to do with like, like a, a, a worm, a, a, a caterpillar going into chrysalis and coming out a butterfly. So at the beginning, it's the segmented crawling thing. Then it goes into the chrysalis and it comes out the butterfly, the beautiful flying thing. It transformed. It had a metamorphosis. It went from something to something. That's what the Bible is saying has to happen in our lives. So for those of you that are struggling to try to grow as Christians, Stop feeling guilty and stop letting people tell you that you're not saved because you're struggling. Of course you're struggling. We all struggling. We have to go from something to something. The Bible just told you that. You might be in the chrysalis. You might be in the thing where you were 
something else, but then you go through something and it's having this effect on you. And when you come out, you're going to be much more beautiful. You're going to have wings. You're going to be something that you weren't before, but that's a process and it takes some time. So if people are getting on you because you, you, you try and you do everything, doing everything you know how to do to be a Christian, but you can't get it all at once and you don't get it overnight. Stop letting people make you feel bad or put you on a guilt trip because it's a process, because I stopped by to tell you, it's actually a lifelong process. Every day you walk with God, there's literally something new. That's the beauty about having an actual relationship with God. Because you've been praying the Lord, what we call the Lord's Prayer since you're 10 years old. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, reverence to thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here it is. Give us this day, our daily bread, what the Lord just tell you? The Lord just told you that God got to feed you every day. Every day is something new with God. That's the truth. If you have a relationship with God, you know, God is ever fresh. God is fresh and new every day. That's why people that don't talk to God, but like three times a year, only know up to a certain level because they haven't spent enough time with him to get to know him. And that's what the Bible's talking about. Because the Bible says you got to change the way you think. You got to make your thoughts new, but you got to have a change of heart and a change of life. In other words, I'm not just not running around talking about, oh, I'm so saved, I'm so saved. I'm laughing because there's so many people to do that. Oh, I'm so saved, I'm so saved. I'm more saved than you because people love that. Remember, I started off the message by telling you that we as humans are the only thing in creation. If you're dealing with a, 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 a tree that's a little shrub, it's close to the ground. Well, the tall, mighty, you know, redwood or the tall, mighty tree, the pine tree, don't look down as known at the shrub. Talking about, mm, I'm taller than you. Don't nothing God made do that but people. Because uh, people love to talk about how they're more saved than other people. That's always amazed me. From the time I was a child to this day, it has amazed me how people always talking about how they are more saved than somebody else. And I'm saying to myself, first of all, you don't know if they're born again or not. Second of all, you don't know where they are in their walk with Christ. Third of all, you can't compare your struggles to their struggles. You don't know their struggles. You just know yours. But people are always talking about how they just, this one ain't saving, that one ain't saving. If they was really saved and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, huh, we need to say what the Bible says instead of what we think. But anyway, uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that the Bible told you, you got to have a change of thought you have to have a change of heart and you have to have a change of life. And that is how people go to church for 20 years and stay the same. They heard the word, but they never let the word change them. Have you ever wondered about that? It's because you have to agree with it. That's why you hear me say, when I say my opening prayer, that's why you hear me say all the time that signs and wonders and miracles will follow those that hear it and believe it and receive it. See, you have to apply your faith. You have to open your mind. Remember, we read Revelation, I believe it's Revelation 3.20, where the Lord says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. You have to open your heart to God's word because he's not going to force his way in. That's what I think has been missing in a lot of teaching is that you can go to church for 20 years. You can be one of them faithful church members. You can be there before the church door open. You can be one of them online because we're online now. You can be one of them online members to where before the service even come on, you waiting in the waiting room. Because you know what it says on YouTube where it says, you know, 10 waiting, like this is going to go live at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock. And you in a waiting room because you can't wait to hear popular preacher. You can't wait to hear mega church pastor. You can't wait to hear famous person. You can't wait. You can't wait to hear. Them, OK, that is not going to do you any good. <laughs> Hearing the word of God, if you don't open your heart, open your mind and change your life according to that word. Let me say that one more time. All of that hearing the word is not going to do you any good if you don't open your heart, open your mind, and change your life according to that word. That's how you know people. If you grew up in church or you've been to church for any length of time, that's how you know people that have been the same since you met them. Then people have been the same for 2, 5, 7, 10, 12, 15, 20, 25, 30 years, and they change that much. Why? Because just being exposed to the word of God 
is just God's part of the process. God is the one that sends his word through his anointed channels, through his anointed vessels, through the spirit of God, helping you understand the Bible, through apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, bishops, deacons, elders, through missionaries, through those people. We're vessels. He's the word. He's the source of all truth. And he's the source of all power. He sends it through a vessel. But that's just God's part of the equation. Your part of the equation <laughs> is to receive that word into your mind and your heart and your life and let it change the way you think. Let it change what you believe. Let it change the way you live. And then the Bible says that as your mind is made new, then you will be able, stop, to test. Wait. The Bible says that the will of God has to be tested. The Bible says the will of God has to be learned. The Bible says the will of God has to be discerned. And the Bible says that uh, you that's how you find out what is a good and pleasing and perfect or acceptable will of God. So in other words, God's perfect will doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen. It's got to be tested. It's got to be discerned. It's got to be learned. And the only way you do that is when you receive his word and let it change your mind and your heart and your life. So now you ought to be able to understand why you have heard over the course of your life so many Christians that are saying one thing and doing something else because they never let the word change them. They never change their mind. They never change their heart. Therefore, they never change their decisions. And they're still doing things that are not producing the perfect will of God. Mm -hmm. One time the Lord told me, this was a while back, one time the Lord told me he was tired of watching his children shout about a victory they didn't actually have. Just let that roll around in your head because we do that all the time. We, it's when I say we, I mean believers, Christians. It's so easy to get caught up in form and fashion and going to church. It's so easy to get caught up in your denomination. It's so easy to get caught up in the way you've always done something until you miss the point. The point of gathering together as believers is not to rehearse our traditions. The point of gathering together as believers is to hear from the Lord because there is a, a manifestation of glory, a presence of God that you can have in the company of other believers. It's not the same as when you're by yourself. You do have to know God by yourself because you spend most of your life by yourself. You don't spend most of your life in church. So you've got to know the voice of the Lord for yourself. But there's something about corporate worship. There's something about when the body of Christ gets together, there's a greater glory. There's a greater manifestation. There's a greater experience. But the point of that is to hear from the Lord, not rehearse our tradition. No, first we read the scripture, then we do the prayer. No, we don't march in anymore. We just walk up. No, we don't use choirs anymore. We use worship teams. No, we don't sing that kind of music. We do this. No, first pastor comes out and gives his announcements. Then we take the offering. On and on. All those are traditions and rules of men, and people are obsessed with that. I've never been anywhere. Now, things have to be decent and in order. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Yes, you have to have an order of service. So don't misunderstand what, what I'm saying. That's not what I'm talking about. Of course, you have to have order and structure. That's biblical, too. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is people get obsessed with it, and they worship it, and they miss the point of being there. And the point of being there is not, okay, so you came in late. So here you come walking down to the front, giving your offering. And, you know, that's what everybody going to talk about. <laughs> the point, <laughs> the point was not traditions. The point was hearing what the Lord was saying through his vessels, through his ministers, so that you could make your thoughts new and that it could change your heart and your life. And then you could figure out what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God for me? Now, in hearing what I'm saying, you ought to be able to understand why you see so many Christians that are just off. They're off because what they learned was religion. What they learned was, uh, well, if I get too deep into this, it's going to be a whole nother hour because uh, don't get me started. What they learned was this dichotomy. And in America, that comes from a very specific place. That's why I don't want to get caught up because that'll be a whole nother hour or two if I go off on that, down that rabbit hole. But what they learned was a dichotomy. And they learned a dichotomy of saying one thing and doing something else. They learned a dichotomy of a very good sounding rhetoric, but
but a very different practical reality and application. There's a reason that spirit is so strong in America, but again, that's a whole other conversation, but that spirit is very strong here. So that's why you have so many people, particularly in Western culture, that's saying one thing, but doing something else and still calling themselves Christians and still saying that living that way is okay. Okay. It's a very specific place that comes from, but I'm not talking about that right now. I'm talking about the fact that it exists. That's how you get people, like I talked about before, to go to church for decades and don't you? They're the same people. They're the same people you've always known doing the same things. You know why? Because they never let the word change their mind. Because that's something you have to do. That's your part of the equation. Because we think of just sitting in service is what does it. I'm a card carrying Christian because I've been sitting in service all the time. That's not what does it. The Bible says that you're going to have to test and discern and learn what God's will is for you at different levels, at a good level, at a pleasing level, at a perfect level. And, and, you know, God is pleased with certain things, but everything you're doing is not acceptable. God is pleased with certain things, but you could be doing some things better. That's what Revelation 2 and 3 is about. The Lord giving us grades where the Lord says, I see this, 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 this. I'm happy with this, 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 and this, but I'm not pleased with this, this, and this. That lines up with what I'm saying here. Revelation chapter two and chapter three, where the Lord is giving grades to the church, lines up with what I'm saying here, that you've got to prove out what it is God wants. And that cannot possibly happen all at once. That happens day by day as you walk with God and receive his word and let his word transform your thoughts and your heart and your life. So now after this prophetic word, you ought to be able to understand why there's so many Christians that saying, saying the christian things, but their life reflects something different, okay? Because they're not actually doing what the Bible says, which is letting themselves be transformed by the word. They have a veneer a facade, an appearance of religion, because that's what they're trying to sell you. One more time after I get this drink of water. They have an appearance, they have a facade, they have a veneer of religion, because that is precisely what they're trying to sell you. That's why you heard me use the phrase earlier in this prophetic word, brand loyalty Christianity. They're trying to sell you their version of Christianity. <laughs> the Bible says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, one God and Father over us all. Once again, that's not what people say. People say, I'm more saved than you because I do this, or I'm more saved than you because I have this revelation from God and you don't have that. That's like the elbow yelling down at the knee, like your elbow telling your knee because your elbow bends towards you. That's like your elbow joint telling your knee joint that the elbow is more saved, is more part of the body because the elbow bends this way and the knee joint bends back that way away from you. So the elbow says, hey, knee, you ain't even saved because you don't do it like we do it. That's what people do. That's why people love their denominations and their religions and their traditions of men. And that's why I told you last time, that's why God in 2020 tore all that down. Why do you think that happened? Why do you think church just went away? Because all them traditions of men, all that religion, all that stuff we're using to define ourselves don't have nothing to do with what the scripture said. I just showed you what the scripture said, that as we receive the word of God without a change of heart and mind and life, we can't even discern what the will of God is. And that's why so many Christians are out of the will of God. I'm going to use my favorite example and then I'm going to wrap up. What's my favorite example, y'all? My favorite example is so many believers that are married to the wrong person. Do you know why they're married to the wrong person? Because a spouse has to be spiritually discerned. That's why. You can't look at someone and tell whether or not you should marry them. You can't marry someone just because you desire them, just because you lust after them, just because you want their body or you want their money or you want their social circle does not mean you can be married to them because marriage doesn't work that way. But how many believers or so-called believers or professing believers do you know that ain't in the right relationship? It's because you missed the perfect will of God because maybe nobody ever taught you what the Bible actually says about it. That's why God calls apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers because the way faith is built is you got to hear it. You got to hear the word. You got to hear it.
and you got to hear from someone that's been anointed and prepared and sent by God to release it to you. That's what those offices are about. You see that? And so that's what I mean when I say that's why so many of us aren't living in the victory that we could be living in because we haven't changed this and we haven't changed this. We cannot therefore change our lives because this got to change and this got to change. You've got to let the word cut out of you everything that's not from God and plant in you everything that God wants in there. Do you understand? All right. That's my time for today. That's the weekly live prophetic word that we got to get our heads straight. Let me put that back up on the screen. We got to get our heads straight. 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 So thank you to all uh, those of you that watch me live. Thank you to all those of you that are watching on the replay. Uh, if you want to bless my ministry financially, because some people have asked me that, you can just send it through Zelle. I'll just give you my email. Just send it straight. That just deposit it straight in the account. No fees or anything like that. So I'll put that in the chat. Thank you to all of those of you that want to bless me financially. So I will be back. Uh, let me see next week. Now, next weekend is actually Memorial Day weekend. So I'm going I'm to ask the Lord if uh, there's going to be a word there, because sometimes on holidays, sometimes the Holy Ghost, you know, says we should holiday. You know, that's biblical, too. Sometimes you have to take a break. So I'm going to pray and ask the Lord. Uh, so check back in my regular time on Sunday, because it is Memorial Day weekend. And uh, see, if not, then for sure I'll be back two weeks after that on, you know, Sunday following that, my regular uh, time at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Okay. Amen and God bless. And remember that what we got to do as believers is we got to get our heads straight. And I'll see you next time. God bless.